right, today's topic, we're going to look at biological classification. Now, this, these next series of topics all have to do with biology. Today, we're going to look at biological classification, which is going to lead us into our discussion on evolution, looking at how life has evolved through time, and then looking at biodiversity and biomes. So let's get back to today's topic, biological classification. This is going to be a fairly short topic. We're going to talk about two really, really important areas of biology, taxonomy, classifying biological organisms, and phylogeny. And so let's begin and let's talk about taxonomy first. Taxonomy is a branch of biology that solely looks at classifying organisms. Now the interesting thing here is we've always used the same system, something called the Linnaean system of classification. Now what this is, is a hierarchical system. So you actually have different levels. You start with the broadest level and you work your way toward the more specific. Now the original classification system had seven levels and you can see them listed there. Kingdom was the broadest level and species is the most specific. Now they actually added an eighth level above kingdom called domain and they did that uh, I can't remember maybe 30s or 40s. I prefer the original system with the seven levels that you see there kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So we're just going to talk about the original system with the seven levels. Now here's the interesting thing. I do expect you to memorize those seven levels in order, but I'm going to give you a pretty good mnemonic device. This is the mnemonic device that I learned when I was in school for these levels. So here it is. Keep plates clean or family gets sick. So the keep stands for kingdom, plates for phylum, um, clean for class, uh, or for order, family for family, gets for genus, and um, sick for species. I think that's a fairly good mnemonic device. And yes, I do expect you to memorize those seven levels in order. Now, what I want to do now is I want to give you a couple of examples of how we do this. So let's say that we wanted to use the Linnaean system to classify a leopard. Here we go. So we start with the kingdom level. So a leopard is in the kingdom Animalia, along with millions of other organisms. Uh, its phylum is chordata. That means it has a nodal backbone. It's a mammal, so it's in class Mammalia. Order is carnivora. Cat family. Its genus is Panthera. And its species is Pardus. So notice, as we've worked our way towards the species designation, we've become more and more specific. There are millions of organisms in the Animalia Kingdom, but by the time you get to Pardus, you are talking about one single animal, the leopard. Now humans, we are naturally lazy, ladies and gentlemen. And so instead of listing all seven levels, what we instead do is we use the binomial form of the Linnaean system of classification where we simply give the last two. So a leopard would be called Panthera partis genus and species. Okay. Now let's do one more example just to make sure you got it. Let's classify us, okay, modern humans. Now notice we share the first three levels with a leopard. We're also in the kingdom Animalia. We're also a chordate. We have a nodal backbone and we're a mammal. So we share those first three levels. We're in the primates order the hominid family, our genus is Homo, and our species is Sapien. But what do we say? We're Homo sapiens. Homo the genus, sapiens the species. Okay? So that's the Linnaean system of classification. Now, before we leave this, I want to do one more example, guys. 
and we're going to start in the kingdom plant tay and we're, we'll actually talk about the different kingdoms here in a second but notice if we start in the plant kingdom we are dealing with over 280,000 species okay we take a step down to the phylum our flowering plants or our angiosperms notice how this number gets smaller now we're only talking about 250,000 species we go to our dicots 235,000 species our rose order now it's 18,000 species rose family 3,500 species genus rosa 500 species but by the time we get to gallica we're dealing with one single biological organ organism so this system guys as we work from one level to the next we are getting more and more specific before the, we actually reach the species designation each organism has its own specific species designation so our gallica only is for something called the moss rose and once again instead of listing all those seven levels what do we say rosa genus gallica species now let's talk about the kingdoms of life. We're actually going to talk about the six kingdoms of life that we have. But before we do that, I want to talk about the two major divisions of life. Prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms. Now let's start with a prokaryote. In order to be a prokaryote, three things have to be true. You are very, very simple in design. You are unicellular, so you're composed of only one single cell, and you lack a nucleus. Okay? Generally, when we talk about prokaryotic organisms, guys, we're talking about microscopic bacteria. Very, very simple life. Now, there are two kingdoms that describe prokaryotic organisms. The first kingdom is called bacteria. Obviously, that's where most of our bacteria are. And we also have a second kingdom called Archaea. These are still bacteria, but they're species that tend to live in extreme environments. Very, very hot, very, very cold, high pressures, high salt content, whatever. Okay? But once again, when we talk about prokaryotes, simple, unicellular, microscopic bacteria. Now, if you're not a prokaryote, you are a eukaryote. A eukaryotic organism is complex. It can be either unicellular or multicellular. So it can be composed of one cell or it can be composed of billions of cells like we are. And it has a nucleus. Okay? So notice the differences, guys. Prokaryotes, simple. Eukaryotes, complex. Prokaryotes are always unicellular. Eukaryotes can be either one cell or billions of cells. Prokaryotes lack a nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus. And in that nucleus, which is often called the brain of the cell, that's where the genetic material or DNA is stored. Now, there are four eukaryotic kingdoms. So we have fungi, that would be funguses, plantae, plants, animalias, animals. Now, after they got done with those three kingdoms, they noticed there was still some eukaryotic organisms that didn't fit into those three kingdoms. And so they made the fourth kingdom called protista. Now, protists are actually microscopic organisms, guys. They're only one cell, but they're complex with the nucleus. So they don't fall under prokaryotic life, they're eukaryotic life. Okay. So there's the exception um, where eukaryotes can be unicellular. All of your proteins are, are unicellular, while fungi, plantae, and animalia, they're multicellular organisms. So all of life on this planet that has ever lived guys can be 
um, classified into one of those six kingdoms. Now, here are our eukaryotic organisms. So here's the more complex forms. We have our kingdom fungi over here, okay, toadstools, mushrooms, uh, plantae down here, and kingdom animalia, okay? Once again, these three kingdoms, usually complex, multicellular organism with a nucleus. Here's the protista guys. So microscopic organisms, unicellular organisms, but they're more complex and they have that brain of the cell. Now here are the differences between a typical prokaryotic cell, which you see on the left, and a typical eukaryotic cell, which you see on the right. Now notice in the prokaryote, all you do is you have a cell wall. And within that cell wall, that red stringy stuff, that's the DNA or the genetic material of the cell. Uh, you have ribosomes, you have cytoplasm, but it's fairly simple in design. Okay, You have a cell wall, you have a couple cellular structures, but very, very simple in form. The first life on Earth, this is what it looked like, guys. Okay, took billions of years to evolve into more complex forms. Now, here's a eukaryotic cell. So, once again, you'll see a lot more feature, features like Golgi bodies, mitochondria that are missing in our prokaryotes, but here's the important designation right here. There's your nucleus with the genetic material or the DNA stored inside, okay? So, once again, guys, simple versus complex. Always unicellular, can be either unicellular or multicellular, no nucleus, has a nucleus where the DNA is stored. Now, let's get to the second half of our discussion, and this is going to be a great jumping off point for our next topic, which is evolution. Now, in order to understand phylogeny, we have to set, accept a simple fact, guys. All organisms on Earth share genetic material with everything else. Okay? I'm sure you've heard that old statistic that humans share, I think it's 99.8% of our genes with chimpanzees. And we do. Okay? They're our closest living primate relative. But would it surprise you guys that we also share genetic material with a banana tree and with a mosquito and with the, o the E. coli bacteria? We do. Everything that has ever lived on Earth shares genetic material with everything else. Now, let's look at this logically, guys. How does that make sense? Okay, Think about it, guys. You share genetic material with a Tyrannosaurus rex, with a Velociraptor. How? Well, it makes sense if you realize we all have a common ancestor, guys. Think about the first life on Earth. And, and we're going to talk about this when, when we get to our life through time discussion. But that first bacterial life on Earth gave rise to everything else. So it should make sense that we all share genetic material. Okay. Now, in the case of a chimpanzee, is it 99.8%? No. Okay. I don't know the percentage of a banana tree or a mosquito, but it's not zero we share some genes in common. And that all goes back to that common ancestor. Okay, That's why this is a great jumping off point for evolution. Because if we accept the fact that we all are genetically rela related, that we all come from a common ancestor, what else do we have to accept? That we all evolved, that we changed through time. Now, what phylogeny is, is I want you to think about it um, called the tree of life, okay? I'm sure you've seen a family tree uh, for yourself, okay? Great-grandparents gave rise to grandparents, gave rise to parents, gave rise to you. Well, this is a, a family tree, guys, but it's a family tree of everything that has ever lived on Earth. This is this tree of life. And when you think of phylogeny, I want you to think of those three words, tree of life. That's what phylogeny is, the study of the tree of life, how everything is related to everything else. Now, a little bit better definition 
is what I have there for you. It's a history of organism lineages as they've changed through time. So it includes, okay, what organisms evolved from what organisms. And so this is this massive tree of life. Now imagine if you were tasked with actually drawing this tree of life. Every organism, the millions and millions of organisms that have ever lived, drawing that in the tree of life. And think about how many decades that would take you. That's what phylogeny is, okay? The study of the tree of life. And once again, if we accept phylogeny, if we accept that we all share common genes, we also have to accept our next topic that we evolve but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, here is a uh, abbreviated version of the tree of life. So in this case, these two are our two um, prokaryotic kingdoms. We have bacteria in blue and then kingdom archaea in red. So the blue and the red that you see, once again, prokaryotic life unicellular simple no nucleus over here on the right these are our all our eukaryotic organisms okay so animals fungi plants and the rest of these right here that that's those protistas okay slime molds and, and other very very uh, microscopic organisms now here's what I want to talk about guys right here at the base of this tree where my arrow is pointing right now that's the first life on earth and we'll talk about that, we think appeared about 3.8 billion years. From that common ancestor, everything that you see on this slide evolved. Okay, so as, as time went on, the bacteria split off on their evolutionary path. We continue here, the archaea split off on their evolutionary path, and the eukaryotes split off on their evolutionary path. But right here where life began, that's the common ancestor, guys. So once again, uh, when you think of phylogeny, I want you to think of two things. First, think of tree of life first. But also, why is phylogeny important in evolution? Well, we all come from a common ancestor. Now, I want to take a look at a little part of the tree of life. This is the reptile portion of the tree of life and reptiles evolved from an amphibian ancestor so here's that common amphibian ancestor that will give rise to the reptiles now just like a living tree guys some of these branches are dead ends we no longer have large marine reptiles like plesiosaurs or ichthyosaurs so these are dead ends okay you can also see um, from this amphibian ancestor, we gave rise to an important group that we'll talk about later called the Thecodons. These were an early reptile form that are going to give rise to the true dinosaurs. And so the dinosaurs are also dead ends. We don't have dinosaurs anymore. But you'll notice some of these branches are still going. We have turtles today. We have crocodiles today. And another interesting thing, well, we also have lizards and snakes today. Here's their branch over here. Now I want to take a look at this branch right here. From an offshoot that will eventually rise into one of the two main forms of dinosaurs, we get our first bird, Archaeopteryx, right here. We think shows up about 160 million years ago. Now why is this branch so important? It's because from Archaeopteryx, all modern birds are evolved today. Now I know there's that whole de de debate Generally, when you, if you think of dinosaurs, you think of the closest living ancestor are lizards and snakes. That's not true, guys. The closest living ancestor of dinosaurs are birds. Dinosaurs had a lot more in common with modern-day birds than they do with modern-day lizards and snakes. Because here's that um, a branch okay, that eventually gave rise to them and an offshoot, and we get the modern birds. Now I want to talk about this branch right here that gives rise to an early group of rep reptiles called the pelicosaurs or fin-backed reptiles like Dimetrodon right here. Now this guy, I'm sure you've seen it, 
but you may not have realized how important it was. From these pelicosaurs, uh, a group arises called the therapsids. I'm not sure you may or may not have heard of them. These were reptiles, but they were mammal-like reptiles. Why is this group so important, guys? Well, if the therapsids didn't exist, they wouldn't have given rise to true mammals. Here's us right here. Okay? And so mammals are, once again, um, derived from reptiles, which were derived from amphibians. Once again, if you accept phylogeny as tree of life, you also have to accept common ancestors. Everything is descended from another group. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about therapsids in our life through time discussion because they're a very important group, guys. Without the mammal-like reptiles, the true mammals wouldn't have descended and wouldn't have taken over as the dominant species 65 million years ago. Now, when we talk about classification schemes, there's been really two main schemes. The first one, the earliest scheme, is called phonetics. In this case, we classify based on the number of shared physical characteristics and we ignore any evolutionary trends. Now in this case, let's take uh, three animals here, guys. A horse, a fish, a trout, and a whale. Now, ignoring what you know and solely looking at their pictures, the trout and the whale are more closely related because they have some common physical features. And the horse is the odd man out. Now, here's the problem with this, guys. When you solely classify based on physical characteristics and you ignore evolutionary trends, uh, you bring up a lot of confusion, okay? Um, gray areas. And so even though phonetics classification was the first scheme we developed, it was abandoned fairly early on because it created too many problems, okay? It created more problems than it actually solved. You can't ignore evolutionary characteristics. And so instead, we came up with a second scheme called cladistics or cladistic phylogeny. In this case, you ignore what the animal looks like and you solely classify based on shared common ancestry. Now in this case, guys, there's no gray area, okay? You're classifying based on the tree of life, which there's only one. Now in this case, the horse and the whale are more closely related because they're both mammals. And the fish, or the trout, is the odd man out. Now, these visual representation of cladistics is, cla is called a cladogram. And this is how you read this, guys. At point A here, you had a common ancestor to all three of these organisms. At point A, the fish split off on their evolutionary path. Um, and then the mammals continue along this line. At point B here, we had a common mammalian ancestor that gave rise to both. And B, the horses split off on their evolutionary path, and the whales split off on their evolutionary path. So in this case, we ignore physical features and we solely classify based on the tree of life or shared um, ancestral uh, common ancestors. Now let me give you one more example of this. If we were to take um, a cladogram of living modern day vertebrate species, now, you'll see the animals at the top, guys. Notice, do we have a lot of physical similarities between a human and a fish? No, we do not. Remember, you ignore physical appearance and solely classify based on common ancestry. So here's how you read this, guys. Right here at the bottom, we have a common ancestor that gave rise to all of these animals or all these organisms at the top. So as you're going through time, we evolve a backbone and the fish split off on their evolutionary path. We evolve lungs and the capacity to live on land and the amphibians split off on their evolutionary path. 
we evolve claws, a new means of reproduction called the amniotic egg, and reptiles split off on their evolutionary path. We evolve mammalian characteristics, fur, and endothermic metabolism, and the mammals go on their evolutionary path, and then we have offshoots. Mice are small mammals here, we evolve opposable thumbs, we get our primates evolving here, and then eventually humans, which split off on the evolutionary line of apes here. So, very different physical characteristics, but in cladistics, we ignore the physical appearance, and we solely classify based on shared common ancestry. Now that is all for that, ladies and gentlemen. Next topic we will talk about will be evolution.